Steve Clifford speaks to media after stepping down as the Hornets head coach. We recap his comments alongside Jeff Peterson's. And then we finally got the Scoot Brandon matchup. We'll get to all of it today. Locked on Hornets. You are locked on Hornets. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. In a minute, cuz we live. We live. We live. <laughs> It's Locked On Hornets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team every day. Thanks for making us your first listen. We're free and available anywhere you get your pods. That includes YouTube. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets. With any winning $5 bet, that's 200 bucks if your bet wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. There's Doug Branson going solo yesterday, helping us out. You can find him on his Substack, everyhornetsboxscore.com. I'm Walker Mail. You can listen to me on WFNZ every weekday from 12 to 3 p.m., 92.7 FM on Wes and Walker. I mean, a ton to get to. It's going to last us for the next couple of days. Going into next week, we have some evergreen content. I saw Mac from WFNZ tweet out yesterday, good old coach and search radio, baby. It's a tradition unlike any other, as yes. Rachel said in response. It was a great <laughs> back and forth because we're all so used to it by now. With the Hornets, with the Panthers, it doesn't matter. We even had a new change. We had a change with Charlotte FC. Coaching search radio coaching search potting it's back and that's because steve clifford steps down we'll get to the first phase here before we move to the next phase maybe tomorrow and next week here doug but he spoke to media and i thought there was a lot i actually thought we would get quite a bit from steve just because he always gives us a lot at the podium it maybe not what we want with certain injury information nobody's going to give us everything and just spill the beans on every single topic but he did give us quite a bit yesterday when stepping down from his head coaching position let's lead it off with you and some of your takeaways what'd you see what'd you hear that you thought was noteworthy Doug yeah it's it's not surprising that Cliff would be open honest and uh vulnerable about all of of this, uh, I mean, it it is weird for a coach to step down with just a week to go, and then, but then that coach who was sort of a, a coach that came in in an emergency situation used to be the coach, and they tried to hire another coach, and that didn't work out, and so they brought in this guy, and then they go through all of these injuries, horrible luck, and now he's stepping down. It's a weird situation, but it's not surprising that he would be open and honest. But Walker, it is weird. Because I don't feel like these types of situations typically play out this honestly. There's a lot of PR speak. There's a lot of, well, I want to spend more time with my family or things didn't work out. And sometimes there's just nothing. Sometimes clean break, fire, nobody says anything. Maybe <laughs> there's probably some like contractual obligations not to say anything. And we don't get sort of the doors or the curtain pulled back like Clifford is doing here, saying essentially that, uh, that he's tired. Uh, that he can't, you know, he can't approach practice in the way that he feels like it, he should in order to get the best out of the players and that the game has changed. I mean, to me, that's the most interesting part of all of this is like, why is he doing it now? And the the, the quote that, that I think is most telling from that came later on in the press conference where he said about the league, it's definitely different now, even in three or four years you know the clientele is just different and it's still great but the challenge is they're younger frankly they're not as prepared to come into the league as they used to be so yeah there's more people involved you know they've always had their people now the people got their people uh so there's definitely more to it than there used to be and th that, that was the quote and then walker he's been on this sort of every time he gets in front of a camera he's been on this almost book tour <laughs> kind of thing where he's telling people about how the guys aren't prepared to be in the league anymore. And I just think the game in terms of coaching has changed so much that it's gotten away from him a little bit. And, and that mixed with sort of energy level and him getting older. And it seems pretty clear why, why he's hanging it up. Well, yeah, at the end of that quote, the, the last sentence was, and you know what, maybe that's a good part of it too. It, it was, it wasn't something that he had in the chamber ready to fire for why he was stepping down. But once I think it was Mike Lissette of Queen City News who asked him about the league that has changed so much, it was almost, you know what? Yeah, it's not anything that I enjoyed. It's clearly not something that he enjoys. How many people are involved with that side of things? I'll just go to the first. It might have been the opening statement here, I, I think, Doug. Mm -hmm. He talked about how the losing was a part of it. I, we don't even have to go really deep into it. 
He said the energy, there was a lack thereof, and that it is a grind that he doesn't have, maybe that he used to have his first stint or maybe his first year. And he said, you know what? The losing probably was a part of it. <laughs> and so you're right. The Hornets, the house was haunted, and the house won. They broke him. They broke my boy. They broke my baby boy, Clifford. <laughs> they did. And look, it, so you, you could play the whole cynical standpoint. The Hornets forced him out. He was either going to get fired and then leave the organization, or he could step down with some dignity and then move to a front office role, whatever you want to roll with. I believe Steve. I think Steve sees an opportunity to keep some type of control in an uncertain future. When this season ends, we weren't sure if Steve Clifford was going to keep this job. We hypothesized that he would after Jeff Peterson spoke, and then they started to lose pretty badly again during the second wave of injuries. And then we thought, all right, well, now it's probably 50-50. Maybe you were leaning more towards Steve Clifford just not coming back at all, and it was 75-25 in favor of a new coach. But here, if Steve Clifford is self-reflective, and he tells you, I am not in a place of motivation where – I can get that going myself yeah, and then get the players going because the players need motivation every single day that guys don't have it every single practice. And if I don't have it, then I can't expect my players to have it. And so he was also talking about when he walks or wakes up in the morning and he's going to work, it's not something where he is dealing with the same type of enthusiasm. It didn't seem like, at least that's what I was getting across. And if he has some control to still want to be a part of the game, he likes coaching, but he doesn't feel like he can do the job. It was a little Roy Williams-esque, if you remember that press conference. Things changing, and then he says he's just not the right guy for the job anymore. It did. It, Clifford is similar to Roy in that fact. I believe that each of those guys believe that they weren't the right guy for the job anymore. But Cliff loves this. And so now he's moving to a front office role, and we can get to some of those responsibilities. I thought some of those that he talked about at the very beginning of the presser were interesting too. But it, it did feel like... He, he doesn't have the same passion for coaching because of the grind anymore, and he still wants to stay in the game at 62 years old. Well, he spent a long time improving bad teams to get them to the point of getting to the playoffs, and then, but he, he hasn't had any playoff success. Like, let's be real. If this were a veteran-laden team with a couple of superstars and they were playoffs bound and they were going to be competitive in the Eastern Conference playoffs, Clifford wouldn't be going anywhere. He would have plenty of energy to coach that particular kind of team. What he doesn't have energy for is to deal with the 19, 20, 21, 22-year-olds who are, are just – really, to be an NBA coach of a young team now, you have to be a college coach. You have to deal with guys that would have been in college previously and finding ways to motivate them. And, and it's always difficult to, to – you have to – it's a different kind of motivation when people are making – you know, tens of millions of dollars. These high draft picks are making $10 million a year. Like it's just a different, it's a different kind of thing. And I think it was, it's something that, you know, some of these younger assistant names that they've brought up, those guys will be prepared to do that. They've, they, they've started in that zone, but you know, Clifford goes back to the days of, of the Van Gundys. It's just, it's just a different time. And, and I think he's right to, to move on and recognize that and not, you know, not force the Hornets to, to fire him. Yeah which I think would have happened next season. If if they had stuck with him next season, had they gotten off to right. a bad start, it was going to end very quickly. Right. Yeah, I, I keep going with the local stuff here, comparing Steve Clifford to Roy Williams, but I also am reminded of Ron Sanchez, the Charlotte 49ers head coach, who stepped down so late in the process, very different from what Cliff did here, with still some left uh, time left to go in the season. But take control over the situation while you still have some of it where Ron Sanchez for the Charlotte 49ers basketball program, he goes back to Virginia as an assistant when he could have come back one more year and then not had a good season possibly and then get fired and then he doesn't know where to go when he knows there's a spot open on that bench, right? Like with Cliff, maybe that gets a little weirder if you decide you want to coach one more season. You still don't contend because it's still a lot. Even if we think a healthier roster could contend, one, now we know there's no certainty that you're going to be healthy. But also, even if you are, we don't know that you're going to contend. This is not your father's Eastern Conference. And so we'll see what happens next year. But then when we see and then you lose, now it's kind of weird where Peterson is forcing you out and there's not this amicable moving up and going into a different phase. And so now it's, hey, Jeff, I don't know if I have it. And the fact that I don't know means I probably don't. 
I would still like to remain with the organization. Plus, I don't want to move again. Like, I'm here. I don't want to do this whole moving to different cities stuff. If I'm, if I'm tired and I don't want to do the grind of having to go on the other 40 games, right? Like, I'm here for 40. I'm on the road for 40. Can I just stay in the front office and help out there? Because I want to help. I still love this. It's, I can't, like... I can't get rid of it. This is my DNA. I yeah. just can't do the coaching anymore. Well, right, and he, he for a third season in a row, he would have to build this team from the ground up again, right, because of all of the injuries. It's not as if, if he had a fully healthy roster this year. Certainly he's more familiar with some of the players, LaMelo, Brandon, so on and so forth, but he's going to have to figure out how this team wins all over again next season, and I think that's where the grind started to kind of catch up to him, like, oh, my God, i got to do this for an, yeah, another season. Right. So. Now, but that's good for the team and that they get to bring in a new voice, a younger voice, a more energetic voice, and, and some and some creativity too. I, th- I think this is great all around. And also, and we can talk about this later on in the show, I do think there is some value for Steve Clifford moving into some kind of front office role. And, and I would I love to sort of figure out what, what role that is, you know? He, he told us a little bit about what, what he wants to do. And I would imagine those conversations were had with Jeff Peterson. Let's move on and let's get to the game last night. Coming up next on the Lockdown Hornets podcast. Don't go to sleep on the Hornets just yet. We got the matchup, Doug. I didn't think we were going to get it, but we got it. Brandon Miller versus Scoot Henderson for the first time this season after Scoot was hurt in Portland the first time these guys met up. We thought Brandon Miller might sit out because it was tanking city out there. It was (laughs) full-on tank. For the Hornets, except for Brandon Miller going out there and competing as well. And so we'll get to that matchup coming up next on Locked on Hornets. This episode is brought to you by Amazon Fire TV. Fire TV is your destination for sports. From live games to highlights to in-depth analysis, Fire TV offers amazing viewing experiences with smart TVs, as well as the Fire TV stick that you can plug into your existing television that provides access to millions of movies and TV episodes, as well as free and live TV. Whether it's opening weekend for baseball or the college basketball tournament, you're going to want to have a Fire TV. Fire TV recently created fire tv channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands all for free that includes all of us at locked on and most of the big pro leagues and college conferences as well fire tv channels let you dive into all of the game analysis highlights and more to keep up to date on all the latest in the world of sports march madness nba mlb lots more there not to mention great news and entertainment and gaming travel cooking videos as well check out fire tv channels on fire tv and alexa devices if you haven't checked out fire tv channels you should trust me on it to learn more visit www.amazon.com slash locked on fire tv This episode is also brought to you by FanDuel. The sports calendar is loaded, and FanDuel's making it even more exciting to get in on the action. Because right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $200 you can use to bet the tourney, Major League Baseball, the NBA, NHL, so much more there also. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make your first bet a big win. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. More Locked On Hornets ahead. Doug, we got it. I wanted the matchup. I wasn't sure if we were going to get it. In fact, I would have bet against it with everybody out. But Brandon Miller did suit up for this game, and he actually played 30 minutes, going 9 of 20 from the field. Not a great three-point shooting night. 1 of 8 from distance. 21 points for Brandon Miller. But we wanted the individual battle here, and we got it between Brandon Miller, our second overall pick, and Scoot Henderson, Portland's third overall selection. Scoot played pretty well offensively. 9 of 16, 4 of 7 from distance for Scoot, 22 points. But we all go back to the end of the game where Scoot misses a couple of free throws and Brandon has a chance to get the Hornets a win, at least a possibility at the win. And then Brandon Miller's shot, it goes begging. Hornets fall to the Trailblazers in what was a tank a palooza. 89 to 86. Your thoughts on the 2023 top NBA draft battle and the Hornets losing this one? I thought it was a really, really fun ending, and it seemed like there was some recognition by both players that, like, all right, I'm going to take over my 100%. team now, and you're going to take over your team, and we're going to see uh, who does this. And and that's really all you wanted out of this matchup that that I think is is not even going to really count because it doesn't have any meaning for any kind of 
uh, regular season or postseason kind of accolades. And so, you know, this one I think we'll have to we'll have to wait till next season when they can get a little bit more meaningful basketball. And it didn't start off particularly exciting. Scoot had eight points and a rebound and two assists, and Miller only had six points after the first quarter. And after the first half, Scoot had 15, Miller had eight. But again, there wasn't much going on. But boy, that fourth quarter picked up. And both of those guys uh, put their teams on their back. And they both, as you mentioned, uh, sort of had some miscues uh, at the end of the game uh, with Miller, you know, taking that final shot. I thought going straight at Aiton like he did on that final attempt was probably ill-advised. And that's where you'd like to see his playmaking skills take over. Now, big caveat here, Walker, big caveat. <laughs> it's tough to make plays when you're out there with a bunch of G-leaguers, right? And so you could totally give him a pass for taking that shot on his own, but he goes right into Aiden's chest, and Aiden was ready for it. The better play from Brandon was several plays before that when Miller was able to stay patient and break Aiton down off the dribble. I was one of the best dribble moves I've seen from him where he gets the switch on Aiton and then has this hesitation into an inside-out dribble move, got Aiton on his front foot, and then he drove and hit the mid-range pull-up, and I think that pulled the game to within one. So it was a fun battle, but, I mean, Walker, if we're being honest here, I mean, by the numbers, th- this was a slightly better Scoot game than it was a Brandon game because – Along with the the 22 points for Scoot, he had 10 assists. Now, he did have six turnovers as well. Uh, but, you know, Brandon Miller was was basically scoring, and, and that was about it. And he wasn't doing it that all that efficiently. The the turnovers were or have been a problem for Scoot all season long. It's been real bad there. And Scoot has had a really tough year. Clearly, Brandon Miller has had leaps and bounds and light years and great distances of measure better than what Scoot Henderson has done this year. That's sure, but reality. in this match, I'm just saying, where's my apology? No, no, well, I just want my I just want my apology. Scoot got the better of Brandon this time. You know, nothing 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 bad to say about Brandon. You know, he's he's got better days ahead. But I just would like my apology from the people out there. Why do you do this to me? <laughs> I'm just trying to share some opinions. And then here you go, talking about apologies again. I did want to say, I, I think this game mattered. In fact, it has to have mattered more for Scoot than it did Brandon. It seems Brandon like it. has He's got all the Rookie of the Month awards. Scoot has nothing to win. Now, even if Scoot had a good year, you're not taking it away from Wimby and Chet. Right. But even so, you didn't. And he knows that. And so this mattered a lot more because it's not even about the Rookie of the Month awards or who might be in contention for Rookie of the Year. It's all about what team was right. And really, specifically, were the Hornets right in taking Brandon Miller over Scoot? And right now, hell yeah, the Hornets were right in taking Brandon Miller over Scoot. And that's got to eat at a competitor, which I don't think that has dwindled at all from Scoot Henderson. I think he's just had a rough year shooting, which that was going to be an issue coming into the league. I thought maybe he would be able to build off of it. It's one year. Who knows? But it's been terrible this season. He's turned it over a lot. He knows the type of seasons he's had with also a terrible basketball team. But it mattered a lot more to Scoot. Had to in order to be a better basketball player in this game. And you could still argue whether he was a bat, better basketball player. I think Scoot was in this one. I think defensively, Brandon Miller wasn't very good here, Doug. Like, I thought there were some problems there. So, I'll, I'll say, if you if you were to measure the importance and the significance of this one for Brandon and for Scoot, I think they both recognized the moment and Scoot got the better. But, like, it's funny because Brandon Miller, having shot terribly from three and still is, like, right neck and neck with Scoot, it goes to show you, you know, like that's honestly it watching this season for Scoot Henderson. If he scores 21 points, nine of 20 from the field and one of eight from three, of course you hate the lack of three point attempts and you would like the assist to go up for a point guard with the ball in his hands as much as Scoot has it. But the efficiency nine of 20 overall, I think you take that more often than not having seen what Henderson has done this year. And so that's the matchup. And we got to see Brandon and Scoot go at it, even if the Hornets lost. Yeah, my, my issue with Brandon in this game was less missing the shots and more just how little involvement he had in the other facets of the game. And this is a game, again, in which Miles Bridges is sitting, in which Vasa Micic is sitting. And so there's opportunity for him to be more involved. And you don't come away with a lot of rebounds. You don't come away with a lot of assists. And – uh, as you said, you know, he now I think a couple steals and a block, sure. But as you said, I think there were some defensive issues as well in this game. And the rebounding was the story of the game. I mean, the, the, this was a horrible – both teams were shooting horribly, bad offenses all around, very disorganized, two 
uh, half G League rosters out there. And so this really came down to DeAndre Aiden and uh, Jabari Walker eating up boards, <laughs> uh, offensive board. <laughs> the guy, yeah. had like, I think Walker had 22 boards. Crazy. But, he did, but, and, and Aiden had 16. So just between those guys alone, 38. 38 rebounds for Jabari Walker and DeAndre Aiden. 36 rebounds total for the Hornets, just to give you a picture. So – all that to say, Brandon Miller, there's there's plenty of room for growth in his game. I think you and I are are both confident that he's going to get there. But, uh, you know, th- this was a game where he could have made a statement, and I don't think that that statement was made. You're going to get the people out. I, was, well, yeah, this, look, this I mean, that. here's the thing. You can be upset with me. Prove me wrong. Like, tell me what in that game was a st- – I mean, there were some moments there in the clutch. I mean, he hit, he hit a go-ahead bucket, I think, with about five minutes to go. And then, you know, again, brought them to within one and hit the three. His only three of the game came late. It was funny because he was like, oh, bleep, oh, bleep, look what I just did. I just hit a three. Like he had some swagger there at the end but couldn't finish. Like, look, I'm not – this is not about saying anything about his future or what he's going to be. I'm just saying this was a a moment when he could have, you know – put the foot on the neck of the conversation of, of Brandon Miller versus Scoot Henderson, and it's going to have to wait until next season. Um, the, by the way, I, I know it's been bad. I'm sure I'm missing out on rosters, maybe even this year. But has it ever been Brandon Miller, your best player, and Grant Williams, your second best player available for a game? Because that's pretty down bad. And that's yeah. with Grant Williams, who has been rock solid and even better than that this entire time that he's been here. But if Grant Williams is your second best player on the floor, that is is going to be tough to overcome even against the Portland team that's been terrible all season long and even if you only lose by three points yeah that that's a rough one with the lack of guys available well yeah and what's concerning is that like Bryce McGowan's gets a big moment uh Nick Smith Jr. gets a big moment Trey Mann you know uh, another game with big opportunities and none of those guys seem to really step up and and hit some shots and 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 put you know th- this would have been an easy game for the Hornets to win by 10 honestly there were moments in this game where they hit a few shots and they're up by double digits and never could do it and, and look you don't you especially for those guys for like Nick Smith Jr. and Bryce McGowan it's not even like you get 82 opportunities which wouldn't be all that many you, you're not even getting that because you haven't seen much playing time post trade deadline so you get these rare opportunities to show out and you and you don't do it I, I think that's it's concerning as the Hornets evaluate what they're going to need out of that guard rotation, that they're not getting really big performances from any of these guys. Yeah, Trey Mann is the one I look at the most. I think you're right. That that seemed like a fun moment for him to possibly take over, and that didn't happen. Good news is we've seen it sometimes from Trey, but this would have been a nice moment for what him. What have they done to Nick Smith Jr.? Like, this guy was – early in the season, this guy was knocking down shots from everywhere. He was an offensive powerhouse. I just – Oh, yeah. man, what have they done to my, my, my guy, Nick Smith Jr.? I have to figure this thing out. Well, yeah, and, and the Hornets, like, they were, you know, saying, hey, if you want to interview him, feel free. He's the leader in rookies for three-point field goal percentage, and there was some good stuff. But Steve Clifford said, can't play him defensively. There's some other reasons I can't play him. And so, sorry, Nick, but you got to be buried on the bench. He, he was mentioned in Steve Clifford's presser yesterday, though, as, you know, one of the guys that, you know, will try to figure out what they can do next year, which I think says something. Let's move on. Coming up next on the Locked on Hornets podcast. Don't go to sleep on the Hornets just yet. We'll go back to that Steve Clifford presser and talk about a few more of the important things he had to say as he steps down as head coach. Coming up next, Locked on Hornets. This episode is brought to you by Robin Hood. Did you know that even if you have a 401k for retirement, you can still have an IRA? Robin Hood has the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar you contribute when you subscribe to Robin Hood Gold. But get this, now through April 30th, Robin Hood is even boosting every single dollar you transfer in from other retirement accounts with a 3% match. That's right, no cap on the 3% match. Robin Hood Gold gets you the most for your retirement thanks to their IRA with a 3% match. This offer is good through April 30th, and you can get started at Robinhood.com slash boost. Subscription fees apply. And now for some legal info. Claim as of Q1 2024, validated by Radius Global Market Research. Investing involves risk, including loss. Limitations apply to IRAs and 401ks. 3% match requires Robinhood Gold for one year from the date of the first 3% match. Must keep Robinhood IRA for five years. The 3% matching on transfers is subject to specific terms and conditions. Robinhood IRA available to U.S. customers in good standing. Robinhood Financial LLC 
member SIPC, is a registered broker dealer. More locked on Hornets ahead. Doug, you want to? Do you want me to hit you with some rapid fire takeaways, or just go with a couple and then save some? I feel like when we say we're going to save some of this stuff for the next week, we never do. So I'm actually not going to give you the power to answer that. I'm going to rapid fire some of my takeaways, and then you can just tell me what you think about them because I have a few. Here are a couple of the other things I thought were interesting from Steve Clifford. I asked him about the front office responsibilities. Hey, what is it you want to do? What do you want to be a part of? What is it that you do here? He said he would like to be involved with the draft, and that seemed to get the biggest smile out of him. And (laughs) if you see what people were writing on the text line, on Twitter, what Hornets fans, it's going to be a a big part of Clifford's legacy is how he wanted Donovan Mitchell over Malik Monk. Mm -hmm. And that decision alone, which is pretty damn verified. Yeah, I need him to admit it, though. If he's going to take this role, I need him to come out and say, here are all the players that I wanted, and you can ask so-and-so about it. And Mm -hmm. that's my my resume. My resume is look at all these players that are all NBA players for other teams that the Hornets could have drafted but didn't, and, you know, I would have drafted them. A lot of people point to that and say, hey, I actually would like Steve Clifford to hang around just because of that decision. But it it does matter. I, I also think so. So you have that, that he wants to be a part of the draft. I, I not that I'm surprised. I just thought, okay, Steve, yeah, go at it, man. You're excited about this. This seems like the next closest thing to passion that you get from coaching that you can get from some kind of front office role, maybe mediating that was mentioned too by Jeff Peterson being that conduit between head coach and player, Jeff Peterson and player. I think that matters, especially with a foundation already having been built with these players, but this guy's excited about the draft and talent evaluation process. Well, yeah, but if the Hornets are planning on being a lottery team for the next few years, and I don't know that that he would be as valuable there because he's already admitted to you that you know these top guys are 19 and 20 years old, and he doesn't know how to evaluate them. He doesn't know what to do with these guys. I think his best role, honestly, would be as sort of an NBA scout that is looking for the right kind of player to bring into this organization. The guys the guys that are hanging around at the sort of mid to bottom of rotations around the league that they could go out and pick in free agency who have the right kind of attitude, the right kind of discipline, the right kind of mentality. That that's He needs to be czar of mentality for the Charlotte Hornets, finding those right kinds of players because he seems to have a good bead, you know, at least on this roster of which kinds of players – um, you know, have that. And, and you know, he was very early on in praising Brandon Miller for having that. And so, look, if, if he can help with the draft, if he can identify between two 19 and 20-year-olds, like which one of them, you know, has w- whatever that, you know, sort of internal it factor is, if he can help with that, you know, and use that wealth of experience to identify that, that would be a, a, a real advantage for the Charlotte Hornets over some other teams that fall in love, you know, with with maybe what they see in highlight reels. Next takeaway, Miles is coming back if Steve Clifford has anything to say about it. Sure. Both of them spoke glowingly about it. I'm not saying we're surprised. It's just it the way Jeff Peterson was hinting at it in a couple of different pods when he was doing his media tour, but also Steve Clifford, it just, you know, part of it's uncomfortable knowing that Miles Bridges was arrested. And there and there are there are things that Steve Clifford just says glowingly and glowingly about Miles as it pertains to what he does on the court and how he shows up every single night. And that's fair. Clifford, you know, talks about what he has as a player, but a lot of it is uncomfortable when there's just a lot, right? Like it's one thing to say, miles has been really good. He's been available. We've loved having him aboard. And then to go the extra mile, that's something Clifford continues to do. But if Clifford has anything to say about it, Doug, and he and Jeff Peterson think alike and they're on the same page, it miles is coming back. Oh, there's just no well, doubt. There's just no doubt about it because uh, Miles um, has done everything that Clifford has asked him to do and more. Played a ton of minutes. Probably never complained about it. Uh, gone out there in in bad situations and losing over and over again, and and still, you know, maintaining. I think, uh, and, and not knowing anything that happened behind the scenes, he just, you know, in front of the cameras and in front of, you know, during the games, he's a professional. Like he hasn't, he, he has, 
you know. He's laid low this year, man. And, yeah. and the Hornets have allowed him to lay very low. Yeah. And so that's, that's, they're the, like, you, you take it. That's fine, buddy. You, you stay in the background. We're good. For the most part, they've done that. Yeah, that's the deal. But then it's all, but it's all going to come down to money, right? I mean, it's all going to come down to what is that worth to the Charlotte Hornets? Are they willing to pay more than a Detroit or some other team is willing to pay Miles? And, you know, how does he factor in in terms of is he the third or fourth best player on this team? Uh, but there's, we've talked about this before. There is no doubt that Miles Bridges is a talented basketball player and put in the right position can impact winning for a team. Uh, how much is that worth to the Hornets? Uh, that's going to be the question of the offseason. And that's a question, by the way, that I don't think Steve Clifford is going to have anything to do with because he's already told you he doesn't want to have anything to do with salary cap or numbers or math. Get that math out of here. I want to do yeah. front office, but I don't want to do math. <laughs> um, two other things I have before we end the show. Yeah. One, I will allow to launch us into the next episode and tease because that might be a whole segment slash episode itself. The other one is, real quickly before I get there, uh, Steve Clifford – like acknowledging something personal is happening behind closed doors, like or it feels like something is going on with his private life. I don't know about how serious. I don't know what's going on. I, it could be. It, I mean, he could just be outright telling us that he just doesn't have the motivation as much as he used to because of a lack of energy. But it, it, and it doesn't seem crazy serious. He's still right going to the front office role, whatever. But it just feels like, you know, and this is well within his right. I wouldn't pry. Like something might be going on too. And I can't help but go back to what was it, Doug? Like 2018, 2017, when Steve had to sit out for a while because he wasn't getting enough sleep. Mm -hmm. And then that's when Steve and Silas took over. Like, I, I wonder. It wasn't just that. Let's, let's just say it wasn't that he just wasn't getting enough sleep. It was that it, the, the fact that he was sleeping so little was affecting yeah. like, the rest of his body. Like doctors were like, dude, if you don't sleep, yeah. you're going to die. It was it was all surrounding just not sleeping. Yeah. That's what was going on. And it was because of this crazy drive and work ethic. And like I remember even Zach Lowe at that time talking about it. Look, man, everybody wants to say it, it, sleeping is almost a sign of weakness and that if you sleep, then you're not working hard. It's like, no, you need it as much as you possibly can get it. And Steve just it feels like he understands it. Logic tells him that he should get a good night's rest. But then he feels fidgety when he's not watching film. He loves watching film. He said that verbatim yesterday, that he still wants to be a part of that process. And so, like, w with Cliff, with Steve Clifford being 62, he's an older coach. We've seen older coaches than him before. But I bet at 62, like, I bet he feels, I don't know, I bet he does feel like 72. Like, with, with the way that we've heard Steve Clifford's work ethic affect him before with the lack of sleep. I don't know, I just... I wonder about him and that's nothing from like I'm not hearing anything that's not any rumors at all it's just like I I know how Clifford is wired we all do if you were here for the first stint and that's got to be hard for somebody that just doesn't give it up ever and then you lose all the time and he tells you yeah. losing at it was a part of it probably was a part of it that's what I'm saying if, if this team yeah. were winning if this team were a playoff competitive team if this team had you know, two all NBA level players on it. And you were just like, oh yeah, this team is going to go at least to the second round, maybe farther. I'm just telling you, there is no way that Clifford is walking yeah, away from that. So yeah, sure. you can, you can give me health. You can give me age. Uh, I think this is recognizing where this team is, where it's going yep. to be next season, where it's going to be probably the season after that. And looking at that and going, nah, and because, Not for me. because he knows the organization, he knows the owners. Now he knows the he knows Jeff. He probably has some inside information about what this is going to look like over the next few years. And it's not, I think to me, all of this is an indication if you're a fan and you're sort of looking at tea leaves and wondering like, hey, is this team really going to like go out and take all the draft picks and go get a star next season and try to make this thing happen? I'd say right now I'm saying probably not. I think they're, they are serious about being patient and this may be a multi-year sort of slow build up to to wait on Brandon to hit all NBA to hopefully wait on LaMelo to do the same thing uh and and Clifford saw that and went I'd I'd rather be in the front office thanks the slight acknowledgement of something you know going on was interesting finally last one and then we can like try to hold it in Doug but the Mark Williams slip again he gave us two Mark Williams slips at the podium the first time around a while back he said will be small the rest of the season. Mm -hmm. You don't say that if Mark Williams is coming back because that's the 771 crazy standing reach guy. No, he's not yeah. coming back. Cool, we're going to be small. 
when he talked about Mark <sighs> Williams continuing to suffer a back injury that is bone related. Oh boy. Back stuff that's bone related, quote, per Steve Clifford. And that feels like the most substance that we've been given on any Mark Williams injury since the low back contusion that turned into a low back injury that turned into him sitting out the rest of the year. Yeah. I it's it. worsome. I hate yeah. it. It's awful. Yeah, it's awful. The Hornets, I, I mean, they just the most, and that's, you know, Clifford's uh, the second half of Clifford's legacy. The first half I think is a coach that could take a bad team, an undisciplined team and infuse discipline into them almost immediately and turn that franchise around into a regular season contender, never got it to a postseason contender. And then the second half of his legacy is he bought a haunted house <laughs> and, and it is just, he has been one of the, the sort of uh, worst luck coaches that uh, we, we've, we've seen, I think, in recent memory. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, this Mark Williams stuff stinks. And I, yeah, I th- that, that it might be a small part of it, too. He looks at that and goes, you know, I don't – one of the things that Clifford has always sort of advocated for is I've got to have somebody in the middle. I've got to have somebody commanding the yeah, game. Yeah, man. And if I don't have that, everything else breaks down. And so, you know, he probably sees that and goes, man, you know, and there's no, there's no savior in this draft. I mean, there are a couple of tall guys, but there, there's no like, oh yeah, you could slot that guy in immediately. And there's no Wimbenyama, there's no Chet Holmgren. So even if they get the number one overall pick, um, you know, that guy's not, that guy's yeah. not walking through the door. So it's, so yeah, I mean, but salute to Clifford front office. Hopefully it is funny that he's like, listen, I don't know anything about this front office, but I, you know, I'll take a job. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, thank it's, you. It, it, here's a, here's a, the, the important thing to take away from Clifford is just be friendly. Be nice to everyone because – and also get a job with the Charlotte Hornets because if you get a job with the Charlotte Hornets, they don't fire you. They just don't – you get, you know, you just get to move into some other kind of role, whatever you want. It doesn't matter if you even know what you're doing or not. You just move into another role. It's, it's not, a nice Not gig. this regime. Not this regime. <laughs> you're right about that. That'll do it. We'll have more Steve Clifford thoughts tomorrow and maybe Mark Williams thoughts going into the weekend, all that good stuff. Uh, Thanks for making us your first listen. We're free and available anywhere you get your pods. That includes YouTube. Hit the notification button and subscribe to us and continue to listen to us uh, anywhere you get your pods. We're still an audible medium as well. Go check out Doug's uh, website, everyhornetsboxscore.com. Yeah, for sure. And you can uh, you can go ahead and sign up. And then in the comments, you can leave your apology on the Scoot Brandon game. Okay. You can just listen to me. me there. Okay, thank it, you. Listen to me on WFNZ. I'll apologize for Doug on Sports Radio 927 WFNZ. Have a great rest of your day. We'll be back with you tomorrow. Now make sure you make it sincere. I know fake apologies when I hear them. 